Good morning and welcome to our daily devotional here in Greenwell Street. We're delighted that you're joining with us and we pray indeed that the Lord will bless us as we spend time together in his word. Well, let us begin in prayer together. Let us pray. Our loving Father, who is the creator of all things and the redeemer of all of his people, we come humbly before you to worship you this morning. We can echo the words of the hymn writer, Great is your faithfulness, O God, my Father. And we can do so, O Lord, because you have blessed us so abundantly. There is not, as we saw on a previous occasion, one word of promise that has failed. We thank you again for the rest and refreshment of a night's sleep. We thank you for food upon our tables this morning that we could enjoy and which would do good for our bodies. And we thank you that we have given us, in our own language, the very word of the living God. We thank you too today for the blessed Holy Spirit, he who has been given to help us and enable us in our understanding of your word and of the outworking of it in our lives. We pray then that you would minister into our lives this day, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we continue our readings in 1 Kings, and we're in chapter 9 this morning and reading verses 1 to 9. The Word of God. When Solomon had finished building the temple of the Lord and the royal palace and achieved all he had desired to do, the Lord appeared to him a second time as he had appeared to him at Gibeon. The Lord said to him, I have heard the prayer and plea you have made before me. I have consecrated this temple which you have built by putting my name there forever. My eyes and my heart will always be there. As for you, if you walk before me in integrity of heart and uprightness, as David your father did, and do all I command and observe my decrees and laws, I will establish your royal throne over Israel forever, as I promised David your father when I said, You shall never fail to have a man on the throne of Israel. But if you or your sons turn away from me, and do not observe the commands and decrees I have given you, and go off to serve other gods and worship them. Then I will cut off Israel from the land I have given them, and will reject this temple I have consecrated for my name. Israel will then become a byword and an object of ridicule among all peoples. And though this temple is now imposing, all who pass by will be appalled, and will scoff and say, Why has the Lord done such a thing to this land and to this temple? People will answer, Because they have forsaken the Lord their God, who brought their fathers out of Egypt, and have embraced other gods, worshipping and serving them. That is why the Lord brought all this disaster on them. We're looking together at the life of Solomon in these chapters in Kings and we have noticed over these past couple of occasions that he was the one following David his father who would build the temple. On our last occasion we saw that the glory of the Lord came into that temple which Solomon had spent some years building. And this is now the second time we're told when the Lord had appeared to Solomon. And it's interesting what we're being taught here. Words that are very appropriate words for us this morning. Now before we proceed, let me just throw in a caveat. And it is this, that when we are reading about Israel in the Old Testament, we have to be careful that we don't just automatically equate Israel with any country. Israel was the Old Testament church, the Old Testament people of God. The proper parallel is Israel 
and the church of today. However, there are principles which are written into Scripture which are applicable across the board because God is the God of all mankind. So as we bear that in mind, as we reflect on these few verses, and the first thing that we can say in 1 Kings 9 is that this was a privileged people. Israel was a privileged people. Now, in one sense, of course, they didn't need to be told that. They already knew it for themselves. It was something they often boasted about. But what was it that made them so privileged? Well, they were privileged because they were the nation chosen out of all the nations of the earth to whom God would reveal himself. You remember the scriptures tell us in Deuteronomy, they were not chosen because they were greatest in number, for they were amongst the least of the nations. They were privileged because God set his love upon them. He set his love upon Abraham, called Abraham out of that pagan place, the Ur of the Chaldees. And it would be through Abram that God's promised seed would come. Not only his choosing of the nation, but also his purpose for the nation. Remember the great promise given to Abraham, I will be your God and the God of your descendants after you. There was his presence in the nation. When they left Egypt, the pillar of fire or the pillar of cloud signified the presence of God. In the wilderness, in the tabernacle, the Shekinah glory comes down, the presence of God. Here we saw in the temple, God comes to dwell in the temple. The presence of God is in the midst of his people. God was there with them. And his power on behalf of the nation. How were they in the land they were in? How had they got to the place that they were now? Well, it was only because God had gone before them. He had fought their battles for them. He had dispersed greater enemies, stronger enemies, more powerful enemies. In order to keep his word and give the land he had promised to Israel. Are we not a privileged people? We look back as a nation, 500 years, 600 years. We were blessed with the scriptures in our own language. We've been blessed with a democracy, a democracy, a constitutional monarchy that was molded and shaped by the teaching of scripture. We have been blessed by a legislator that has been guided and directed by the commandments given in God's word. We have been blessed that there is scarcely a hamlet, a town, a village in Northern Ireland where you couldn't hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. We are a privileged people, a highly privileged people. Second thing, not only is there here what we are told a privileged people, but we have a solemn warning, verses 6 and 7. But if you or your sons turn away from me, then, but, then. One thing that privilege can often do is breed presumption. Breeds presumption rather than responsibility or accountability. And of course, this is something that Israel would be often guilty of doing. Two examples. In Jeremiah, when Jeremiah said to them that they were going into bondage, they said, oh no, we can't go into bondage. And they quoted the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. It became their mantra. They thought that by saying this, this somehow would create some protective shield about them. They'd become so superstitious. Whether the Lord was in the temple or not was neither here nor there. As long as they had the temple, that's all that mattered to them. Or John 8, remember what Jesus said. They said, we are Abram's seed. And he said, well, if you were Abram's seed, you would love me. You see, presumption had come in. And the prophet wants to warn them, wants to warn Solomon. The Lord wants to warn Solomon of this. And it is a warning for us all to take heed of. 
It's a warning for us all. If Israel, God's chosen nation, had no unconditional guarantees, then no other nation on the face of the earth, no one denomination or any congregation has exemption from the but then we need to examine ourselves as a nation, as a province, as a church, as a congregation. Can it be said of us, we are so greatly privileged, but then. And the third thing is, there's a simple reason for this. Forsaken and embraced, verses 8 and 9. They have forsaken the Lord their God and they have embraced other gods. You see, the Lord was no longer honoured, day was no longer observed, his name was no longer respected, the people had turned their backs upon Almighty God. But not only had they forsaken God, they had embraced other gods. For Israel, in the wilderness, it was a golden calf. In the nations it would be the Baals. Oftentimes it would be sacrificing their own children in the fire. And this was the cause of their rejection. They had not only forsaken the Lord, but they had embraced wickedness and evil as well. And the fact is that what was true of the nation of Israel is sadly true of nations today. Again, we take our own nation. What has our nation done with the word of God? Oh yes, they still want some religious ceremony performed to hatch, match and dispatch. You see it, don't we, in London. These grand services held to remember people who had not the slightest interest in the things of God whatsoever. Singing great hymns. I don't know if you ever noticed this. If you've watched these services. The people in the congregation. Half of them don't even know the hymns they're singing. They're meaningless to them. But you see people rejected God. As a nation we've rejected God. Our government has rejected God. They have embraced other gods. They have embraced the laws of the crowd. They have embraced the shouts of the crowd. It's reminiscent, isn't it, of Jesus. The crowd were stirred up by the, the leaders. Crucify, crucify, crucify. And we're getting the same today. This clamouring mob who are wanting to pull down anything that speaks of Almighty God. And his rule. And they want to set up the idols of self in his place. But what will happen? What will happen? Well God told his people. This is why you will suffer. You will be cut off from the land. People will think you are an object of ridicule. They'll mock you. They'll scorn you. What has these last months done for us as a nation? Well, it has shown something of the spirit of what we were created to be, like God. People putting their lives on the line, the NHS members, the care assistants, so on. But has it really changed what we are as a nation? It hasn't, has it, one bit. The legislation that has been passed the laws that are being foisted upon us. You know, in the words of Isaiah, darkness is over all the land and gross darkness, the people. Our prayer is that a light might rise and that God might yet have mercy upon us. Let us pray. Our loving Father, we are mindful that we are by no means what we ought to be as human beings. But we are also mindful 
that what we are is solely by your wonderful grace, for we are undeserving of ourselves. Father, you know the things that are upon our hearts at present. We pray for our province. We pray for our young people. Lord, you know the circumstances they face, the challenges they face. And I pray, Lord, that you would draw near to help in all of these circumstances. We pray that you would now bless us, that, Lord, through this day, whatever it might hold for us, we will hold fast to the Lord our God. We will not let go of the truth of his word, and we shall know his blessing upon us. Father, we pray, have mercy upon us in these days for the sake of your dear Son, our lovely Saviour, even Jesus Christ the Lord. Amen.